what is God ideal for man? Anyone is free to give her opinion or answer. To reproduce himself in us. To reproduce himself in us. We will become like him. All right. All right. Brother Bruce, any thought? Yeah, I totally agree. We concur with the elder that God, we would, that we would be in the very image of likeness. Yes, of God. Amen. 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 Quite correct. All right. To reflect his glory. Yes. All right. Amen. So, one of our scripture reading text. It says, Shall a trumpet be blown in the city, and the people of God be not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord hath not done it? In other words, shall evil exist in a city, and the Lord don't know about it? It's impossible. It's impossible. <coughs> What were trumpets used for in the past Bible times? Warning. Right? So let us take our Bibles and see some of the things that trumpets were used for in the past Bible times. Today we are going to be studying the Word of God. Amen. So please have your swords in hand and open the Word of God. Amen. This we, we must get back to the habit of opening the written Word. Amen. Because very soon... All these technologies will fail us. True. Yes. Right? In Isaiah chapter 58, a call is made. Right? Isaiah chapter 58. Right? It says, Cry aloud and spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Right? In Isaiah 55, in Isaiah 58, verse 1, the call is an assembly. Right? In Numbers 10. Verse 5, there's another call being made. That call is an alarm. Numbers 10, verse 9, that call is a time for war. So in Bible times, the trumpet is blown, but the sound of the trumpet is a different event that is happening. But today, the call for today is going to be alarm. And I will lift up my voice so that the people of God shall and must affect their souls and bring forth fruits of repentance. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 10. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 10. When found, say amen. And if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in the book of the law, and if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul. So God is asking us for us to turn to him yes. with all our heart and all our soul. Take your Bibles again and turn to Psalms chapter 40. Where are we going to, friends? Psalms chapter 40. Psalms chapter 40. And we will read from verse 7 on to 10. When from say amen. amen. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me, but not me, but Christ. I delight to do thy will, O oh my, oh my God. Yea, thy law is written within my heart. I have preached righteousness in this great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O oh Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not Conceal thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. So God is telling us through his word that he is going to declare his righteousness. Alright? And God desires to see his children live a life of righteousness. Live a life without sin. Have victory over sin. Is victory over sin possible? Yes. Alright. So please... Those of us who are 
going to view this video after. If you are sitting in a congregation and the pastor says that victory over sin is not possible, please leave that congregation and come join us at Midnight Cry. Because that congregation is preaching error. Alright? Give the trumpet a certain sum. There are many who do not understand the prophecies relating to these days. And they must be enlightened. What shall we do, people? We shall enlighten the people of the world and the church to the prophecies and what they really mean. It is the duty of both watchmen, pastors, leaders, and laymen to give the trumpet a certain sum. So it is all of us inside here responsibility to give the trumpet a certain sum. It is not the elders alone, the pastors alone, but everyone who accepts the gospel commission of salvation to the world must lift up their voice like a trumpet. All right? Be in earnest, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. All right? So there must be no toning down of the message. Message not muffled, right? There must be no toning down of the truth. No muffling of the message for this time. The third angel's message must be strengthened and confined. Confirmed, Confirmed sorry. So the third angel's message must be strengthened. But before we get to the third angel, we must first accept the first and the second. Right? Because we cannot just start to come from 3, 4, 5, 6. We have to start from 1, 2, 3. Alright? So, we must first embrace the first other two angels' message before we can get to the third angels' message. Alright? Where am I? The 18th chapter of Revelation reveals the importance of presenting the truth in no measure terms, but with boldness and with power. There has been too much beating about the bush in proclaiming the third angel's message. The message has not been given as clearly and distinctly as it should have been. So what is the third angel's message? If any man worship the beast on his image. Alright, let's go to Revelation chapter 14. Right? And the third angel followed them saying, if if follow them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Alright? So we see here that we have a special message for a special time to give to the world by a special people. And God is depending on us Hey, he's counting on us to give this message to the world. Because our message is a life and death message. Either you be eternally saved or you be eternally lost. It's a life and death message. And we must behave as it is really what it is. Right? She says, life and death message. We are, as a people, in danger of giving the third angel's message in such an indefinite manner that it does not impress the people. So we cannot stifle this message. This message is not a message that we must say certain things and remove certain things. We must give it in plain, clear, cutting truth as it is. All right? Our message is a life and death, and it must, and we must let this message appear as it is. The great power of God, then the Lord will make it effectual. So why is our message not effectual? 
because there is no effort and emphasis behind it. We are to present it in all its telling forces. So if we're not presenting it with telling force, there will be no power applied to it. All right? Let's continue. So now I'm going to draw a parallel with the church in the time of the first advent with our church. All right? The watchmen on the walls of Zion should have been the first to catch the tidings of the Savior advent. The first to lift up their voice, right? To proclaim him near. The first to warn the people to prepare for his coming. What are we supposed to do right now? Not to warn the people of his second advent? Yes. yes. All right. But they were at ease, dreaming of peace and safety. And mercy, Lord. While the people were asleep in their sins. So let's take a look at this for a while and contemplate. So sins make us dream, make us cry peace and safety, mm -hmm. and fall asleep. Mm -hmm. So, you see this thing? Yes. <laughs> you see this thing? We really don't know and understand how powerful this thing is. Mm -hmm. So, go, go back up a little bit. But they were at ease, dreaming of peace and safety, while the people were asleep in their sins. So in other words, their sins have not been confessed and gone to the most holy place where Christ could now forgive them of their sins, right? Jesus saw his church like a barren fig tree covered with pretentious leaf yet destitute of precious fruit. It goes on to say, there was a boastful observance of the form of religion while the spirit of true humi humility. humility penitence and faith very important faith which alone could render the service acceptable to god was lacking instead of the grace of the spirit there were manifested pride formalism vainglory selfishness Oppression, a backsliding church, closed their eyes to the signs of the time. So we see why the, the Jewish church rejected Christ. Because of their sins, they went into a backsliding condition and they could not discern the signs of the time. Is this quotation only speaking to the first advent? No, it's not. It's also speaking to the second advent too. Because when we look at the world churches today, they are closing their eyes to the signs of the times. Mm -hmm. Everything that we see happening, some of them low, they are even opening their church to practice certain sins. Mm -hmm. Which is a definite abomination in the sight of God. Right? But here at Midnight Cry, we want to be a people of the book. We want to be repairers of the bridge. We want to be living in accordance to the word of God. And God's ideal for us is that we live lives victorious over sin. Alright? So we're going to take our Bibles now and we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to be doing a lot of reading from the Bible today, brethren. Hebrews chapter 1. And here the word of God says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath appointed thee, anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And we know oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So God wants to anoint us with his Holy Spirit. But God will not anoint us with his Holy Spirit if we have sin lodging in our hearts. I'm going to repeat, God will not anoint us with his Holy Spirit if we have sin lodging in our hearts. The two cannot go together. Peter in Acts chapter 2 says, 
Acts chapter 2. I'm not hearing those pages, brethren. Now, have we left our Bibles at home? Acts chapter 2 says, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So if there is no repentance of sin, there cannot be no receiving of the Holy Ghost. Alright? Take our Bibles again and let's turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 1. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1. Alright? Therefore, we ought to give more earnestly heed to the things which have which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sip. So when we read the word of God, and God give us an instruction, we should ask God for his power and his faith and his grace to carry out the instruction. Amen. When we read the word of God, and it tells us to claim a promise, we should claim the promise by faith. Whatever the word of God says, he means. God don't say something and don't mean it. Alright? Let's continue. Isaiah chapter 42 verse 8. Isaiah chapter 42 verse 8. For I am the Lord... This is my name, and my glory will I give to, give, give not, my glory will I not give to another, neither praise to graven image, right? And we know what is the glory of the God, right? The glory of the Lord is seen in his creation week, with his crowning touch up on the seventh day Sabbath, Right? The Sabbath testify of the Lord's glory as creator. The glory of the Lord can also be seen in the sacrifice for sins. Right? You can find that in Romans chapter 6 verse 23. The glory of the Lord is also seen in his ten commandments that was given on Mount Sinai. You can find that in Deuteronomy 5 verse 4. The glory of the Lord is seen in his plan of salvation. To save you and I from sin. Not in our sins, but from our sins. And we're going to turn very quickly to Exodus chapter 14, verse 13. Exodus chapter 14, verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation, the glory of the Lord. You see it? So we can say now, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you this day. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them no more. But have breaking news, my friends. You see, examples of these Egyptians that we shall see no more, what God wants to rid of us, is pride. Egyptian Amen. number one. Amen. Anger. Egyptian number two, yes. backbiting, Egyptian yes. number three, deceitfulness, Egyptian number four, covetousness, Egyptian number five. God wants to take away these Egyptians, yes. but we are holding on to them so tight. We don't want to let go of these Egyptians. But if we hold on to these Egyptians, can we see the full salvation of the Lord? It's impossible, brethren. It's impossible. So the Lord wants to do a mighty work for us and in us. But we have to submit ourselves, resist the devil, and then he would flee from us. Alright? And he wants to give us his Holy Spirit. But sadly, some of us are on the borders of committing the unpardonable sin. Why do I say that? You may find my words being kind of harsh. But you see, it is true. And it's time that we have a true Christian experience. We must stop sinning presumptuously. 
We need to stop sinning presumptuously. presumptuously. Sinning, confessing. Sinning, confessing. We all need to stop living like the Jews in Christ's time. Because they knew that they could have gone, purchased a lamb, and go sacrifice it, and the priest confess their sins. The lamb is cheap, so we do it continually. But today, in our time, because we know Christ, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world was slain once and for all. We too sometimes fall in a similar position. We know Christ is going to pardon us, but we sin presumptuously. Is that what God wants from us? No. So why then we do, do we do it? Why then do we do it? It is time that we truly tap into the gospel power source that is available to us to live a life above sin daily. Yes, my friends. Victory over sin is possible. Yes. But it's a daily experience. One day, two days, three days, and then it becomes a week. And then it becomes a month. And lo and behold, it becomes a year. And then it becomes two years, three years. And that's the same step that Enoch walked with God. And there was found no more place for him, for he was translated. He walked with God daily. Not on the Sabbath alone, but he walked with God daily. We cannot want to walk with Satan for six days and then come in the church on the Sabbath and walk with God. Amen. It's impossible. Amen. You're going to still be walking with Satan thinking you're walking with God. Amen. All right? So let's take our Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And this is why I said many of us are on the borders of committing the unpardonable sin. He says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So if we grieve the Holy Spirit, can we be saved? So why are we sinning and confessing, sinning and confessing daily? Will this, not, will this act or action not grieve the Holy Spirit of God? We need to get serious in our Christian life experience, on our Christian journey. We need to get serious. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. Hebrews chapter 10, and verse 26. And it reads, If, for if we sin willingly, willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remained no more sacrifice for sin. So hello, if you know that you're not supposed to do X, and you're going on the road and do X, the sacrifice for your sin does not remain. So therefore you will be left to pay the penalty of your sins. Amen. This is a serious thing we are dealing with called sin. And we sometimes take it for granted. But God wants to give us the power to live above sin. Amen. It is there available. Christ showed us the way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Once we follow the blueprint and give our life to him, he will give us power to live above sin. It all starts with this one step by submitting to him. All right? Hebrews 10, 20 to 22. By a new and living way, which he had consecrated for us through the veil that is to save his flesh. Right? This is the experience we're supposed to have. A new and living way, right? Once we accept Christ, it's supposed to be a new experience. We are now born again. Yes. Right? Having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near 
with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from the evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. All right? So Christ wants to give us this new experience, this new birth experience, but we must submit to him so that he can mold, shape, and fashion us after his will. Yeah. All right? The angels visited the earth to see who are preparing to welcome Jesus. But they can't discern no tokens of expect expectancy. No hearers, no hear, no voice of praise and triumph that the period of Messiah coming is at hand. So today, angels are visiting. And they are watching, they are taking record to see what we are doing, to see how our life, what our life is reflecting. They want to see if we are bringing forth true fruits of repentance, true fruits of the kingdom of heaven. And sadly, in the time past, they saw no fruits from the leadership of the church. And so it is likewise today. The angel hover for a time over the chosen city, all right? Jerusalem, over, over Seventh-day Adventists. And the temple, were, the temple where the divine presence has been manifested for ages, but even here is the same indifference, all right? Even in our world today, the same indifference. The priests in their pomp and pride are offering polluted sacrifice in the temple of God. So we have to be very careful when we enter the temple of God that our sacrifice be kindled with fire from heaven and not polluted sacrifice. We must try our God-given best to rightly represent God. Christ wants us to be blameless. Christ wants us to be faultless. Christ wants us to be victorious. Right? Here's what he says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17. And their sins and iniquity will I remember no more. This is the judgment Christ wants to pronounce on us today. Amen. When our sins and iniquities are remembered no more, Christ will now place his seal upon us. Then and only then we will be sealed. Until then, if we continue to behave like the pig, in the river, on the bank, no seal. We're going to be sealed for hell, but not sealed for the heavenly kingdom. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Verse 3, and it reads, Blessed are they, blessed is he that readeth, and they that heareth the words of the prophecy of, of this prophecy, and keep those sayings which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Let's keep on down to verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, whom is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loveth us and washed us from our sins in his own blood so Christ this is what Christ want to do the most important thing that Christ want to do in us is to remove the sins yes. then he can truly work right. unless these sins are not removed Christ cannot work to his full capacity right John chapter 1, First John chapter 2 verse 1. He says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. Right? That you sin not. So God's desire 
is that we sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen. But his first obligation is that we sin not. Amen. That's the first obligation. The second is if we make a mistake. The second comes into play. But Christ's first and number one desire is that we sin not. Is that we live holy life. We live righteous life. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 19. He says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Right? So it's God's desire that we depart from iniquity once and for all. No sooner that we depart from iniquity shall the Lord come. Because why? The servant of the Lord says, she said, Christ is waiting with longing desire. For what? For the manifestation of himself. What, is the, what does Christ look like? A sinless being. For his character to be perfectly reproducing us. What does that character look like? A sinless being. Then and only then will Christ come and claim us as his own. So until then, we are spinning top in mud. The issue of the great controversy is sin. Why do I say that? You see, First John chapter 3 says, it says, Whosoever commits sin transgresses the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. You see, sin is a direct attack to the character of God. And God wants to put his character in us. And if we keep sinning, we are keep attacking God. So are we going to keep attacking someone that we love? Why then do we do it? Why then do we do it? Right? It's, it's, it's a sad place, but it's the reality that we keep sinning and confessing. Sinning and confessing. God wants to give us his full power to live life over and above sin. Amen. Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16. It says, Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, Christ is saying. Let us reason together. Say the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be made as white as snow. Though they be as red as crimson, they shall be as wool. So it's Christ's desire to clean us, to purge us, to uproot this wickedness that sin has left us in. Matthew chapter 18 verse 3 says, and, and he said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. The little children that he's referring to here is the little children in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. Say, My little children, say not. Alright? This is what Christ is waiting for. For a group of people to truly reflect his image. Yes. Alright? Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 4 says, Hebrews 12 and verse 4. I'm not hearing those pages, brethren. Have we forgotten our Bibles at home? It says, Ye have not yet resist unto blood, striving against sin. Right? So it's very important that we resist this thing called sin. Verse 1 reads, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with, a, with so great a cloud of witness, so we have examples that are gone before us who have been victorious over sin so we have no excuse if they could do it based on the power of christ we can also do it all right so these are the witness that we must look on pattern to the best of our ability and try to strive to this standard let us lay aside every weight of sin 
which dwelt so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us all right so the race that is set before us is a race that we are struggling against sin why because we try to do it on our own strength that's why we are struggling if we truly tap into the source of our strength we will be victorious right but today christ wants to restore a better covenant with us individually and this covenant is a covenant by creation because he created us and by redemption all right so we'll take our bibles and turn to colossians chapter one colossians chapter one Colossians chapter 1 verse 14 and it reads in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of our sin yeah. what better promise can we ask for yeah. right now we're gonna take a look at the word covenant because the word covenant is a very important word that we need to dissect and understand all right we're gonna take a look at the word covenant so we're going to go and understand that covenant is an agreement between one, between two or more individuals. So we're going to go to Genesis chapter 6. And we're going to see here that the covenant is everlasting. And the gospel is everlasting. And they are both intertwined together, one in the same. But I will establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou, thy sons and thy wife, and thy son and thy and thy son wives with thee. All right. So this covenant that God wanted to establish with Noah was not only to save him from the flood, but it's to save him from sin. Because when we look carefully at the word covenant, we will see and understand that the covenant is intertwined with salvation plan. And salvation is to save from sin. Alright? We're going to turn to Psalms chapter 89. Psalms chapter 89. Verse 34. Psalms 89 verse 34. It says, My covenant will I not break, nor utter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Right? Alter the thing which is gone out of my lips. Skip on down to verse 36. His seed shall endure forever. Right? And his throne as the sun before me so he has made a covenant and his seed shall endure forever but this seed is specifically pointing to jesus so jesus is the covenant and jesus came to save us from sin all right we we, we, we coming down brethren we're almost there the covenant agreement points to jesus christ the Lord and Savior of the human race. Right? Psalms 119 verse 9 says, He set redemption unto his people. He had commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverent is his name. Deuteronomy 4.13 And he declared unto his covenant, which he commanded, and which he commanded you to perform even the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone but today i have a different application to these two tables of stone you see these two tables of stones are our hearts and our minds and this is where the lord wants to place his law because when we read hebrews chapter 8 verse 10 he said for this is the new covenant which is the law 
that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Say the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be my people. Yes. Alright? So this is what the Lord wants to do for us. Right, my sister Keisha? We can become faultless, sinless before the throne of God. Yes. What is your desire, my friends? Because God ideal for us is that we overcome sin. Who, 1 Corinthians 1, 8 says, Who shall confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? What is your delight? I delight to do thy will. Oh my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Is it your desire to have the word of God in your heart? Is it your desire? Do you want to be victorious over sin? Yes. Psalms 19 verse 7 says, Say the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony is sure, making the wise simple. So the law of God has the power to convert the soul. That's why he wants to write it here. This have, it has the power to convert the soul. Alright? So as we come down, we're going to go to Daniel chapter Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 verse 4. When Fong say amen. amen. And I prayed unto the Lord my God. And made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant of mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. So we see here, that Daniel is tying in the connection with the covenant and the commandments. So the commandment keepers have a covenant with God. Right? And God wants to restore this covenant with each and every one of us. Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the obligation to cease. Obligation to cease. And for the overspreading of the abomination, he shall make it desolate. Even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So, the, the context here is that Christ came to restore this covenant with us. And each and every day, he's knocking at the door of our heart to fulfill his part of the bargain. Because the covenant also means an agreement with, with individuals. But this cannot happen unless we give him the opportunity. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door of our hearts to him, he will come in yes. and sup with us and we shall sup with him. Alright? We shall sup with him. So the covenant that was established also with, with Abraham, we see in, in Hebrews, Abraham looked for a better place. Right? Abraham looked for a better place. Hebrews chapter 11. Right? Hebrews chapter 11 verse 8 and 9. By faith Abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance obeyed. And he went out knowing 
not knowing whether he went. By faith he so journeyed into the promised land as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob. The heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which foundation whose builder and maker is God. And we know John said he see a city coming down. Right? And this is the city that Abraham is looking for. So the covenant that was established with Abraham that to make Abraham a father of many nations. This is just the first part of the covenant. But the bigger, broader spectrum of this covenant is to save Abraham and his household from sin. Yeah. All right? She says, let me read to you a powerful quotation. As Christ presented the law, Christ presented the law, the, the principles of the law of God in a direct forcible way, showing his hearers that they had neglected to carry out these principles. His words were so definite and pointed that the listeners found no opportunity to cover or raise objections. In other words, they found no opportunity to resist what Christ was saying. Because he, everything that he said was founded on the word of God. Yeah. Whenever we speak, whatever we say must be founded on the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. For we have a more sure word, brethren. Let us please continue to build on this foundation. Yes. Anything outside of the word of God and spirit of prophecy is error. And the wind and the storm is going to come and take it away. And we do not want to be taken away by the wind and the storms of life. All right? Oh, what a lesson is this wonderful story of Bethlehem. How it rebukes our unbelief, our pride and self-sufficiency. How it warns us to be beware, to beware less by our carnal, criminal, criminal sorry, indif indifference, we also fail to discern the signs of the times. All right? And therefore, know not the day of our visitation. Right? The uplifted Savior is to appear. The uplifted Savior is to appear in his efficacious, efficacious work as the Lamb slain, sitting on the throne, upon the throne, to dispense the priceless covenant blessings. So who is the covenant? So we see who is the covenant? All right. The benefits he died to purchase for every soul who should believe on him. John could not express that love in words. So Christ is the covenant brethren. And today he wants to establish that covenant with us. So we can safely say, that the gospel and the covenant are everlasting and they both point to Jesus Christ.